Welcome to The Storytellers, the radio show and podcast that features those who choose to leave their mark on the world through the art of story. I'm your host, Grace Salmon. I look forward to our time together today. Now, let's meet our storyteller. Welcome to episode 84 of The Storytellers. Today, my guest is the amazing Beth Brode. She is an award-winning executive producer, director. She's a pioneer in music television. In addition to that, she's a mentor to so many people and a memoirist. She has worked with some of the biggest names in Hollywood, and you will recognize every single one of them. Sting, Yanni, Alanis Morissette, Prince, Michael Jackson, Alana DeGeneres, Aretha Franklin, Bob Dylan, Cindy Lauper, Barry Gordy, and Jane Fonda, among many others. I have to tell you, Beth, it is a true honor to have you at the Storyteller's Microphone. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm so grateful to Amy Ferris, who put the two of us together. She's been an amazing force in this world. But so have you. You have had a, I'm going to just say, massive career. And I've heard it said about you that you are have an innate ability to just see a great opportunity. Can you talk a little bit about that? I, I've always had the ability to see pop culture trends sort of ahead of the ahead of the, the, the times. Okay. I can sort of sense um, when things are going to shift and where there's opportunity. Um, the music video business, there was no music video business. And because I was a film major in college, I was film and television major. Mm -hmm. I really was, I was skilled. I, I knew how to film things. I knew how to tell stories with, you know, with film. So when I got out of college, my other passion was music. So I went back to Chicago where my family lived and I got a job at a jingle production company, which was fantastic for me because I love music. I love musicians. Mm -hmm. And I learned how to produce music, how to put music, you know, shoots together, not shoots, I'm sorry, music, music sessions together. And um, this was something that really changed me because I was so in love with the music business, what I thought was the music business, but I was very young. So I did, I produced jingles and then I went on to manage recording studios in Chicago. And then I decided that if I really wanted to be serious about being in the music business, I would have to go to Los Angeles. So I got a job as an assistant to a big producer, music producer, and came out to Los Angeles by myself and um, was very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time because this producer knew all of the record companies, a lot of the artists, and I was able to meet people at a very high level. I ran across a director that was filming music artists, and actually on video. He was making a video of a music artist performing. And I thought, oh, that is so cool. That's just fantastic. I love that. So he taught me, and this was pre-MTV. This was before MTV yeah. was launched, okay? It, it, it's mind-boggling, yes. So he taught me to do this. So I kind of was part of this small circle of people in Hollywood that knew how to make film and video and also understood the music aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So one day I got a call from... Warner Brothers Records asking if I would take a film crew down to Florida to film a new artist that they had, that they were about to launch on their label. And they said, uh, go down to Florida. He knows exactly what he wants. Uh, his name is Prince. So Prince. Yeah. And this was, this was, this was me producing videos off of my bed in West Hollywood. Okay. I didn't have a company. I didn't do, you know, I just was like, I'll do it, right? Just give me the money and I'll do it. I'll produce it. And so I went down to Florida and I, I worked with Prince and it was really an incredible experience. Uh, he was he was amazing. I knew he was, I think he was 26 at the time. And I just knew he was a huge star. I, I just knew it. So it was really exciting. So when I came back 
to Los Angeles after shooting the footage and editing it with Prince. I went to all the record companies and I said, I just filmed this guy named Prince. And they were like, whoa, because they'd never seen him, right? They didn't just know. Just amazing. And, and tell just, everybody which video this was. Oh, Little Red Corvette. Yeah, I was producing Little Red Corvette. Just, just, just Little Red Corvette. Yeah. So, but th that was something, you know, filming music artists to me was like the perfect blend of, you know, pop culture, music, film. It was just everything that was my sweet spot. Okay. So, months went on and I started to realize that these videos, these little videos that the labels were financing were gonna create a big explosion because people really loved watching these videos. So cut to, we're making videos and then MTV launched. So at one point during the eighties, um, my company, by the way, I launched the first one of the biggest music video companies in Los Angeles as one of the only women who were doing that. These, these companies were all owned by men. And um, I was able to take both of my passions and put them together and be very, very successful, creating basically a new art form. I mean, this, this didn't exist. And it revolutionized television and film and it was, you know, it was a moment. It really was a moment in pop culture uh, history. And, yeah. and you you mentioned something that's so important. You did this at a time where no other women were doing it. So yes, you had a skill set. You say you were lucky enough right. to be in the right place at the right time. But there's something way more than that that makes you the storyteller you are. So what's that nugget okay. of being a woman? I, I believe that we were the first generation of young girls going to college who could not wait to get into the workplace. Okay. I mean, we just ran towards our futures. I could not wait to work and to the thought of working with rock stars and pop stars. And, and, you know, I mean, I just, I, I, it was just a dream come true for me. And I, there must have been something, Grace, inside of me that said, you can compete and you can do anything, you know, that men can do. Men don't have to run production. You know, I knew production. I also had a really good sense, a good eye for discovering directors. So I was able to find a lot of talent, represent that talent, produce for that talent, and grew the company that I had over time. And yeah, there weren't a lot of women. The, the directors were all men. There were no women directors. But the women, at least in my company, the women ran the show. What was that like to be a woman at the head of your career, at the head of your industry then? Was it difficult? I mean, we hear so much now, you know, the, the Me Too, the Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> Okay, well, in the 80s, that stuff was, you know, I mean, it was kind of, you know, I, there's a fine line, okay? I mean, I never had ran into any, you know, abuse issues like that, but it was wild and crazy times. Sure. And, and yeah, people, I remember the, my company was very successful. And so there were a lot of guys that were running companies and they were jealous of me. Okay, and I remember hearing a rumor that I would get mani pedis on my sets where I was, you know, on the set when I was working, which is mm -hmm. a total lie made up by a guy. Okay. <laughs> and, and, you know, and it's hard when you, first of all, when you're successful at something, okay, people love to take shots at you. But when you're a True. woman who's doing it in the, in that time, this was the eighties. Okay. This is late seventies and the eighties. Um, yeah, you you uh, you you got to be strong, but but there was something inside of me that some kind of confidence that I must have had. Where well, and that excuse I, me, that still exudes today. I love personally, Beth, that you can say I was very successful, and it doesn't sound like you're trying to toot your own horn or uh, that. It, it is a statement of fact. I was very successful, and you say I, it with beautiful confidence. I, I mean, I was, and so you, the first question you asked me was, how do you, how do you know how to stay ahead of the curve? Yes. I knew that music videos and music television 
was going to revolutionize the music business and the video business. Okay. I, I knew it. I could see it. I could feel it. So I was drawn towards that and was able to build a company and be very successful by seeing that. When I had finished music videos, because I mean, after 10 years of running around and shooting bands, I know it sounds really glamorous, but it was really, really hard work and exhausting. I was very drawn towards technology, towards things that people in Hollywood didn't even know about. They were talking about the internet and the world and the World Wide Web. And, and all I could see was, okay, how do we take music artists and how do we use the web in order to promote them, in order to take their marketing and promotion one step further? So I was able to then pioneer the first webisodes, the first little teeny little videos that were um that were, you know, on the web. I mean, th there wasn't, when I got involved in technology, there was no video on the web, right? So I have this, I, I've had this sense of knowing where industries are going and emerging industries around, around art. So that's kind of my specialty. I can, I can see that and I just run towards it, right? Because it's exciting. I love that you say that you, we were the first generation of women to really run towards our careers. Yeah. I mean, men, there were many people, of course, before us, and we stand on their shoulders. But I do think that that's a great image that we ran towards careers, maybe in a way that previous women, at least en masse, uh, did not. You're also very brave. I, I've listened to interviews. You're a risk taker. So there are massive risks involved in this work as well, correct? There is. There is. And I've, you know, I've been successful, but I've failed. And I've, I've done things that maybe didn't work out the way I wanted them to. There were, there were years and, and, and not years, but times in my career where I was kind of lost and I didn't know quite where I was going. Because when I finished music videos, you know, I was kind of like, I was a big, big fish, right? And then I took a risk by going off into other areas that people didn't really know or understand and a place where I didn't have the same mastery. But you can't be afraid to go off in a new direction and be afraid to be, you know, the less smart person in the room. You have to be willing to say, I want to learn from everybody. I want to see what this is and I want to be able to apply what I'm learning to the industries that I already know, right? I, I love that vulnerability about you too. So you can speak with that confidence, but you can also share with us that it hasn't always been beautiful. And I think the, the, the amount of work uh, that most of us do, uh, and we try to make it look easy, but it is an incredibly exhausting- it's really hard work. And it's really, really hard work. Yeah. And, and you've also, you know, you, you've shared your vulnerability and you've lived life backwards in many ways. You had an experience with breast cancer, which really changed your life. And would you share some of that? Sure. Um, I had just started a new job in a startup internet company here in Los Angeles. Of course, I would be doing that. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and um, it was so exciting. I mean, I loved it. And I had just gotten married. And, you know, so he's working and I'm working and I'm traveling and they want, you know, they want me to be the face of this new piece of technology that they wanted to launch. And, you know, it's just, it was, it was great. I mean, it was a wonderful, wonderful time in my life. And about six, seven months into my new fabulous cutting edge job, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, for the first time in my life, I had to accept the fact that I was not invincible. And it was the first time in my life where I felt the rug was pulled from underneath me and I didn't know how to fix it, okay? When you're a producer, you, um, you wanna fix everything. You know, it, 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 producing is a lot of problems and fixing things in order to advance, you know, an agenda or an initiative. Um, this was something I had absolutely no experience at. I, I just, you know, I didn't even have a, I had like an, an aspirin in my, you know, <laughs> that's all I had. I was just too busy running around and doing everything. So this really stopped me in my tracks. 
it was besides the, the the painful aspect of the whole thing and the fear and everything that goes along with it, the chemotherapy absolutely changed me, you know, to being a very sort of frightened person and a person that wasn't totally sure about my footing and if I was going to live. Okay. This is very different for me, you know, because I, a pretty confident person. Mm -hmm. This was really, really, really hard. So I had to stop working eventually. And, you know, I thought, okay, this is it. It's over. You know, I had a nice run, but it really wasn't over. And I just had to have the patience to go through the whole thing and heal and, and, you know, and get my life back together. But what happened in like the third year of being cancer free is that I, I said to my husband, I, I want to do something more now. I want to do something with my life that will be the most value creating thing that I can do. Okay. Cause we, we lived a wonderful life. My husband and I, we going out and parties and traveling and all of this stuff. We had a great life, but now I really wanted to give everything I have learned, everything I've achieved to someone who has nothing. So I couldn't have, I couldn't physically have a child. I was 49 and um, we decided to adopt an orphan from Taiwan. And um, I adopted her at 50. <laughs> so having a child at 50 years old was challenging, but I was like, I'm, I, I can do this. I know I can do this. I've got this. <laughs> I've got this. <laughs> How but hard can it be? I didn't really have it, to be honest with you. I mean, it was, I, I'm telling you, from going from a person that, you know, was like hiring film trucks and people and lights and all this kind of stuff to like putting a diaper on a baby was, was a big, big challenge for me. But um, my life just ch changed so drastically. And so from out of that cancer experience came, you know, my daughter. And I continued to work. And I actually, right before we adopted her, I was doing probably the best work of my career, working with Sting and with Yanni and with a lot of artists, not just one video, but like spending a couple of years helping them develop all of their content right? And helping them market all of this stuff and traveling all over the world. And I still was like, okay, I love this. I'm, I'm thrilled doing it. But there's got to be just one more thing that I can do with my life. Okay. So I had a child at 50. And I went through that whole thing. And um, the reason I'm writing my memoir is mostly for my daughter. Beautiful. Um, so tell us a bit about your memoir. Um, like I said, huge life, massive life, big career, live life backwards. Tell us a little bit about your memoir. Okay. Well, I, I joined a memoir class last year with Amy and I spent a year in this class with people talking about their lives and how they did what they did and how they became the people they became. And I started to pull up all these stories. I mean, I was like forced to sit down and say, okay, let me think about these moments in my life. And I realized that music had been part of my life from the time I was a very little girl in my house, okay? And my house with my parents. And I could see that there was a line that went through my career and my life. And I, there's so many things that I have done in my life that I thought, okay, my daughter has never seen me like this. She doesn't know that, that Beth, she knows mama, you know, she knows her mother, um, but she didn't know that Beth. So I thought, okay, I'm going to write this all down as, you know, a generation, like I said, a generation of women who just ran after their futures and the things that I was able to accomplish the struggles that I had, the things I had to overcome, I think are pretty universal. 
you know, they're not just specific to me. They're just universal struggles if you continue and you just, you don't give up, you just keep moving forward. So I'm writing this really for her so that she can understand the me before she arrived. Oh, I think that's so important uh, that you're doing that. What a legacy. Do you have a working title for the memoir yet? The working title is Raising Liberty, that's her name, Raising Liberty and My Other Rock and Roll Stories. Oh, I love it. Beth, I am so grateful that you um, graced us at the Storyteller's Microphone today. I hope you'll come back and share more of your amazing stories. Thank you so much. Grace. I would love to. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a copyrighted episode of The Storytellers by Grace Salmon and Authors on the Air, Global Radio Network with the amazing Beth Brody. Thanks. That concludes this episode of The Storytellers. I'm so glad you could be part of the story today. I hope you share the stories, tell your own, and come back for another episode. Because when our stories are told, everything changes. I'm Grace Salmon. <laughs>